Okay, good evening, everybody. It is six o'clock. We'll go ahead and get this meeting started. It is Thursday, June 28th, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, 6 p.m., Sacramento Metro Fire Board meeting. If I can, if we can get a pledge to the flag, get everybody stand, please. Director Jones. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. The open session meeting is videotaped for Cablecast on Metro Cable 14, replay on Monday, July 2nd, 2018 at 6 p.m. and Tuesday, July 3rd, 2018 at 2 p.m., on channel 14 webcast, or excuse me, webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. The open session meetings are also available for viewing at district website at www.metrofire.ca.gov. Right now is the opportunity for members of the public to discuss matters of public interest within the district jurisdiction, including items on or not on the agenda. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? There are no speakers this evening. Thank you very much. And before we move on to the consent item, uh, I've been asked that we take a little short recess to take a look at that beautiful truck that's parked right out in front of uh, headquarters here. So Chief Harms, if you could kind of queue it up as far as what we're gonna go take a look at. Sure, um, I, I think it's important. It's a little bit of a show and tell, but we sit here and go through the budget and uh, talk about different apparatus and equipment that we're buying. Uh, truck 50 is here, the A-Shift crew is here. Uh, to kind of show it off, uh, it was delivered recently, went through the get ready, and is now in service. So uh, if you remember the difference between an engine company and a truck company, an engine has the hose, the water, uh, the truck company is the toolbox. And uh, if you look at support on the fire ground, they provide everything from forcible entry to ventilation. Uh, it has the large ladder on the top of it for flowing water on defensive operations, um, and is worth about a million dollars. So uh, thanks to the crew that came down. I'm not real sure if they, they, I know they were on a fire yesterday, but I don't think they flowed any water out of it, but it did already has gone on its first multiple alarm fire. So we can take a minute and walk down with the crew. And if you guys have any questions, we'll take a look. All right, thank you. We'll go into a short recess. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started again. Call this back to order. I wanna thank everybody from uh, truck 50 to bring that new toy out. I call it a toy, but it's got multiple uh, instruments inside that it's neat to see whenever we approve something of that magnitude, especially when it comes to that dollar amount, that when you get to see it and actually look at all the uh, instruments inside that can help the public, it's very nice to see. So thank you for taking the time to come down here and show that to us. Moving on to the consent items. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll move the consent items. I'll second it. Okay. Madam Clerk, we have a motion and a second. Dr. Gale. I have a question on three, on the consent item. I'll allow a question, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the benefit for the people of this district, for this uh, business improvement district? What do we get out of it? Would you like to answer that, Chief Arms? Or sure, I, I think one of the things that we find is that we are part of the community with 40 fire stations out there, uh, the property that we have out there and that uh, we become part of that community. Um, being in that, that position, uh, the benefit is for the PBIDs is that it's usually that improvement that happens to that area. The benefit for us is as improvements happen, you have decreased crime, you have more uh, opportunity for businesses to come in and be successful. It draws people into those areas. So a small investment on one side often has a huge investment on the other side for the folks that live in the area and for that community. My reply to that has always been, do they have police service or do they have a board of supervisors? Are they exempted from those kind of things? Somebody is not being diligent in seeing that it's taking place, those things. So we create another kind of government or something, a shadow of government or what? Is that so? Is that an option for the system that we have in place to be utilizing, doing these things that you take an oath to do? Chief, I can answer that question. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, those are usually specified in the P bid themselves. Um, so there are a number of P bids in the area. Um, in the supporting documentation, it would specify whether or not security is included in those costs. 
I believe for the Fulton one, it is included. There is a, a, a private security detail um, that provides an extra layer, uh, extra layer of service to those business owners. I'm a, a ben, what is it, Thomas Jefferson kind of government fellow. We have the government. Somebody's not doing their job or something if we have those kind of problems continuously. But I would hope that they would be looking at those things that certainly would, uh, you know, name those kind of things that we're having in our neighborhood. Maybe that's noble, but I put it back on the elected officials. To do. And, and they do. I, you know, they coordinate, having been involved with them for a while now on behalf of the district. So have I. You. Yeah, they, um, they coordinate with sheriff's office and local police very well. Um, and that effort is definitely coordinated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your explanation. Sure. Thank you. And we did have a motion and a second. Ready to call. Director Gale. Noble idea. Uh, yes. Gould. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Wood. Aye. Clark. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Ann Barnes. Aye. Motion passes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Moving on to the presentation items. Community Partner Award from Sacramento Kings. Pistol. Good evening, President Barnes, members of the board, Chief Harms. Uh, We've been fortunate to partner with the Sacramento Kings and their community impact team for about the last year. And in working with them, we realized a lot of parallels between what we do in our community relations division as well as the rest of our district on almost a daily basis and a lot of the efforts that they make on the greater uh, good of the community. In fact, one of their uh, hashtags and kind of their uh, slogan is uh, hashtag do good. So that's something we kind of uh, want to do ourselves as well within the district. They've done a lot of other things to support our members, uh, specifically those who work with our uh, USAR team and have responded to some of the uh, hurricanes in Houston as well as Puerto Rico. And additionally, some of the members that went to the wildfires in uh, Northern California as well as Southern California in the past year. Um, but it goes a little bit further than that. They've done a lot of good stuff for the members of the community of Metro Fire. So they've supported our uh, cancer awareness program. Uh, they've hosted our engine at, their, uh, at the Golden One Center for a few games, as well as they've <clears throat> allowed us to partner with them to go pick up uh, cancer patients, breast cancer patients, and surprise them with game tickets and other uh, goodies. So really, they've helped us uh, expand our name, expand our brand, at the same time, helping members of the community with their healing processes and uh, kind of their road to recovery. So we're proud to call them a uh, partner of ours. Uh, we look forward to doing more work with them. And I'd like to invite up Betty Lowe, who is their director of their community impact team, and to present her with our community partner award for 2017 on behalf of Metro Fire. Later? Yeah. Would you like to say something before you go sit down, Ms. Lowe? <laughs> no. <laughs> We'd love to have you. Oh, thank you. That's very sweet of you. Um, we're really honored to be um, recognized by the SAC Metro Fire Department and, and the board as well. We're um, integral in partnering with uh, Captain Vesto and Chief Harms. We've been really excited to work with them year-round. We were very lucky this year to have a player in George Hill who very much was committed to wanting to bring first responders to games. Um, and not only just bringing them to games, but also to meet and greet them before every game and say hello and say hello to their families and their kids and thank them for their service. And so we were very fortunate to have that really great relationship from the beginning to be able to lean in and then say, bring 10 of your um, you know, firefighters and their families and have a night out on us. And one of the things we do really well is we get to show people a little bit of fun. We get to take your mind off the hard work that you do on a daily basis, and, and we all know how hard are your... Um, firefighters work and we know those are long long hours and you don't always get time with your family and your kids and so if we can open up our arena and show you a good time um, and take your mind off of the, the daily work and the daily grind we're happy to do it so uh, we appreciate the partnership we have with you we know we lean on you as much as um, possible when there are tragedies and uh, emergencies in the community and we know you guys are always there so we appreciate you as well well thank you very much for the kind words we truly appreciate it congratulations <clears throat> 
I have to admit, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to come to a game because of George Hill, but from uh, my day job, and I will tell you exactly what you just described as who he was, but also you were our guide that day, and my daughter loved you, and for the way you treated us as families, brought us down, truly gave us a VIP treatment. We thank you and the King's organization for that uh, partnership. It means a lot. Thank you. Moving on to the UAV presentation, uh, Assistant Chief Wagaman and Captain Gifford. Uh, good evening, Director. Yeah, go ahead. Do we get to fly those? <laughs> Damn. Absolutely. I'm going to say a big no. Yeah, I'm going to say a big no. Well, good evening, Directors, uh, President Barnes. Chief Harms, my name is Tyler Wagaman, Assistant Chief of Operations. And uh, as most of you are very much aware, and we would love to make the community more aware, the Metro Fire has numerous programs in place to keep our citizens safer, as well as our members safe. And one of the programs that we're gonna to speak to this evening is that of our UAV program. And primarily due to a lot of advancements the program has made over recent months. Um, no better person in this department to speak to these advancements than Captain Ryan Gifford. Uh, Captain Gifford is our UAV program manager. Captain Gifford. Thank you, Chief. Uh, good evening. As uh, Chief Wagman said, my name is Ryan Gifford. I'm a hazmat captain at Station 109 on the sea shift, and I'm also the uh, UAV program manager. I was asked to come in this evening and uh, give you guys some information on our UAV program. Uh, the Metro Fire UAV program actually started in 2014. Uh, it's been around for quite a while. Um, at that time, the uh, FAA's restrictions and the basically cost of technology made it fairly prohibitive. So uh, despite some pretty valiant efforts and quite a bit of legwork, uh, the program never got off the ground, so to speak. Um, we, put it, we put it down for a bit and waited for um, the times to catch up to where we wanted to be. About a year and a half ago, that kind of started to coalesce into a better program. The cost of technology came down significantly. The uh, bang for the buck, so to speak, with the technology has come way up. And the FAA has basically figured out that these don't fall out of the sky regularly, and if they're handled properly, they can be a real asset for uh, public agencies. So you start to see a huge insurgence of public aircraft use really all over the country, all over California for sure. Um, so we started a... a Working on this program about a year and a half ago, built it up, put together perspectives. Chief Wagman and I worked on it and got to a point where we were very confident that we could push this forward and make it a really integral part of situational awareness gathering for our on-scene commanders. And that's really what we've built down our program to be. Um, I have a video put together that will kind of just walk through some uh, kind of everyday uses and what we expect to see with the aircraft. Um, See if I can get this started. There we go. So, as I said, the primary impetus for our use of unmanned aerial vehicles for Metro Fire is to gather situational awareness for our on scene commanders. We wanted to enhance their ability to make good decisions on the fire ground, on the rescue ground, so that the information that can be provided to them, can be pushed out to the guys on the line who are doing the work, and we can make those decisions fast, efficient, and effective. As you can see, the ability to put an aircraft overhead of a small building, or in this case, a much larger building, really gives you a different view than can, any, than can be gathered by any other way. Um, we have the ability to put aircraft overhead very, very quickly. We've completed all of the certification paperwork with the FAA and have uh, authority to fly within our jurisdiction and actually beyond that. Uh, we're in the process of training up 25 pilots at this point in time, and we've started purchasing equipment, both training equipment and some of our frontline equipment to basically put us in a position to start flying these missions for our on-scene commanders. Beyond the obvious use of uh, fire incidents, one of the areas that uh, unmanned aerial vehicles really shine is in obscure emergency settings, so whether that be flooded down areas, or it be hazmat areas, or it be technical rescue areas, we can put aircraft and sensors over scenes that you wouldn't otherwise be able to access. We have thermal imaging sensors on our aircraft, as well as uh, RGB cameras, zoom cameras that give us a better feel for what's going on underneath. And this is all critical information for 
that on-scene commander who may or may not be able to see this from their location. This is from flooding last year. Um, this is actually flown by a different set of aircraft, but what you're about to see here in a second is the PCA bridge completely underwater. So that gives, this is the ability to give information to say our boat crews as they're trying to maneuver in a position to make a rescue. Uh, we can use thermal imaging cameras over the top of this to look for stranded victims in otherwise extremely murky water that they might be perched on a rock or an outcropping and they would just be un difficult to see at the very least. Um, this is one pallet of our thermal imaging camera and if you imagine that as being a swath of river, that bright spot moving across it uh, is a potential victim that's on top of the water and you can see how easy that is to see because of the contrast. This is a different use of thermal imaging with a different pallet. And this basically enhances, uh, it's a thermal image, but it effectively enhances uh, operations at night. So if we're operating over a sparsely populated or densely populated area at night, and we just can't see what's going on, whether it be a defensive fire or whatever else it may be, this gives us the opportunity to put uh, a sensor in position so that our on-scene commanders can make better decisions as we go forward. Um, currently, as I said, we're training up 25 pilots. We're getting ready to uh, roll the <coughs> program out at the end of fire season is our current operational plan. We don't want to interfere with fire season. Trying to start anything in the middle of fire season is never a good idea. Um, so we intend to roll it out at the end of fire season and get it into position so that we can really move it forward with gusto for next fire season. Um, we'll definitely be making uh, a lot of training flights. We have a lot of opportunity around here and we have some very eager pilots to move forward. So we're very excited about the program and the continued support from the district, and I uh, think that this is going to be another one of those instances where Metro Fire is really leading the way. We've had um, several outside agencies approach us, ask how we're doing this, what we're doing, because everybody's kind of learning together. But this whole region is picking up on the use of unmanned aerial vehicles, and we're right out in front of it. Any questions I can answer for you guys? Oh, thank you for that presentation. Any questions or comments from the board? Thank you for that. That's really exciting to see us stay at the front of this technology. It's, it's obviously going to change, I think, uh, the dynamics of what you all do. Uh, one of my questions is, what's the lifting capabilities of some of your bigger aircraft? Well, it obviously depends entirely on the aircraft. The, the large aircraft that you see right there the will... The one that should have a King sticker on it? That's yeah, something very it. similar to that. <laughs> That aircraft uh, is rated to about about two pounds, kilogram, about 2.2 pounds, sure. which is enough for us to fly a personal flotation device, right, a life jacket, exactly. and a helmet over. Right. And that aircraft is rigged for that right now. Uh, some of our larger aircraft are actually in the seven and eight pound class of, of payloads. So you're talking about some fairly serious equipment that can be moved around. Um, the focus is always on safety. And, and one of the things you don't want to do with aircraft is, is overload them. So... These, these aircraft have the absolute capability to do direct action missions, but our intent really is to be able to provide that standoff uh, visual um, uh, situational awareness for our on-scene commander. But they do have the capability to deliver payload, to fly high lines across the river, all kinds of stuff. Will these be part of a battalion's kind of a, a tr attack structure, so they'll be based in a, a BC's unit, or are you looking at putting them on the trucks, or kind of what's the deployment thought that you guys have well, there's a, there's a lot of different ways to do this, sir, and, and as I spent time talking to departments around the country and, oh. and uh, in the Bay Area, trying to get a feel for what people are doing, uh, there's not a good answer. So we moved forward with a system that works for us and makes sense for us, and our the intention of our operational plan is to place the larger field aircraft on the battalion chief's vehicles. Most of the calls that you would expect to see these aircraft fly at will have at least one, if not several battalion chiefs, so we'll have a variable uh, fleet of aircraft to pull from. Uh, our on-duty crews, qualified pilots, will then get basically pulled either from an automated or request stance, and uh, the, the crew that they're part of that day will come to the scene and then dispatch the aircraft. There's paperwork with the FAA, as you can imagine, that has to be done, but we've, we've streamlined that down to a very, very short amount of time. We're hoping that uh, reasonable reflex time right now from the time of dispatching the pilot to the time of flight is about, about 15 minutes, which, if we dispatch them early, puts us right in the middle of the larger incident. Mm -hmm. That's the intention. Uh, we have to beta test all this in, in the wild and see how it's going to work, but the ability to have our pilots spread out throughout the district on a day-to-day -day basis means that we can bring both the appropriate equipment and the closest pilot to the scene in a rapid fashion, as opposed to a central dispatch method where you're trying to take 
somebody in a vehicle with an aircraft and get them out to Rancho Marietta or get them up to Antelope or get them down to Florin. Sure. Excellent. Thank you for Thank all you your much. work. Yes, sir. Fantastic. Dr. Gill. The ability of uh, that kind of aircraft is just about unlimited. Is how much we would want to put in one. There are some could to do a small tank. Yes, sir. It's a very valuable tool for especially uh, jungle fighting and they use a lot of it in Vietnam, as a matter of fact. But that's, that's a smart move, extremely smart. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Thank you for the presentation, truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the action items for the uh, SCURS retirement, or excuse me, payment agreement, CFO Thomas and Eric Stern. Okay, good evening, directors, Chief Harms. Uh, Amanda Thomas, Chief Financial Officer. Um, and uh, this evening, um, we're here to present um, a recommended payment agreement with the Sacramento County Employees Retirement System, or SCURS, regarding the district's unfunded pension liability with SCURS. Um, so in terms of a discussion outline, I will start off with just some brief uh, background um, regarding this issue, and then I will hand it off to Eric Stern, who is SCURS Chief Executive Officer, to talk about the pension liabilities um, and uh, provide some information and some context there. And then um, I will pick it back up with, with the specific recommendation that we have this evening. So in terms of background, as some of you may be, may be familiar with this issue, others may not be as familiar, so I'm just going to go over a little bit of the history. Um, and the history is that employees of the Florin Fire Protection District were members of SCURS for service provided prior to January 1st, 1997. Um, upon the 1997 merger of Florin and American River, uh, the, those former Florin employees became members of CalPERS for future service. So all, all service of those employees from January 197 forward is CalPERS service. Um, and, and at that same time, American River and SCURS entered into an agreement regarding the payment of the unfunded liability for those, Florin, for, for those former Florin members for their service prior to January 197. Um, under that existing agreement, the unfunded liability is recalculated annually and it's required to be paid off by the district by July 1st, 2022, or another date that the parties mutually agree upon. Um, as of June 30, 2017, that number for the unfunded liability is $45 million. Um, Eric's going to talk a little bit more about you know, what that is, um, uh, what, what, what's behind that. But before I turn it over to him, I really do want to acknowledge that both he and his staff, including Kathy Regalia, the, the COO of SCURS, um, have been great partners in working with us to try to find a, a mutually agreeable solution to this, um, including um, coming out here in April and, and presenting a lot of the information that he's going to talk to you about to, um, to staff and also um, representatives of Local 522 so that we could understand the issue and talk about options moving forward. And it was one of those options at that meeting that we are recommending to you today. So with that, I will turn it over to Eric. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. President and members of the board. Eric Sturd with the Sacramento County Retirement System. Uh, I also just wanna echo Amanda's comments um, and thank the staff here and Chief Harms uh, for helping us with this uh, a very long-standing issue we've been working uh, for years on, but really uh, very earnestly over the last sort of five months that have been able to come together with this agreement that's before you um, today. Uh, just a couple kind of big picture things I wanted to point out is that, you know, this issue uh, really is about keeping the promises that, that have been made to the retirees of the Florida Fire District and their families. And it ensures that funding is going to be made available um, to support their benefits for the rest of their lives and their beneficiaries' lives. 
And it also balances our fiduciary responsibilities that we have at SCRS with the long-term financial and budget planning that this district has as well. So I just want to spend a couple minutes talking about um, sort of how we got here. And I want to apologize because it looks like your board meetings are usually full of interesting things like fire trucks and drones. We're going to look at <laughs> charts and numbers, which is what we do at our board meeting. So just um, a little bit of an overview. The Florin Fire uh, District uh, um, membership group that we're talking about represents about $90 million in uh, total pension liabilities. Uh, as you can uh, are probably familiar with, most of the Florin Fire, Fire uh, District members have retired um, a while ago. There's about 120, 130 inactive members. There's still about 19 members. It's probably uh, more retirements coming every year. Uh, so these are folks who have earned their SCURS service before uh, 1997, so it's been 20 years. They're, if those 19 um, folks who are still active firefighters in Sacramento Metro are um, probably close to the end of their careers now. So this chart really sort of shows the story of what we're talking about. So the red line at the top shows the liabilities. That's sort of how much is how much is owed um, in the you know is a, is a present value for lifetime benefits, and the blue line underneath shows the assets. And so you, what you always want when we talk about pension funding is the blue line to match the red line. You have to have enough assets to pay the liabilities, right? So in 1996, when this uh, when when Floor and Fire initially merged with uh, the American River Fire District. Uh, there was there was sort of a, uh, uh, there was an accounting of how much how much funds were in the SCRS trust fund to pay for those those members. It was effectively uh, sort of fully funded, so those lines sort of matched. And then over the next few years, the dot com boom happened, so the assets actually exceeded the liabilities, which is a great thing. Um, then the dot com boom crashed. You see that in the, around two thousand, and the assets go down. They start trending back up with. Um, the housing boom, and then you see the housing bust in 08, 09 with the Great Recession. Now, the liabilities still are going to click up a little bit every year for inflation. Every year that members um, accumulate service credit, even though there's just a couple handfuls left, it adds to, adds to some of those liabilities, as well as just as assumptions have become more conservative with CalPERS, with SCRS, with every retirement system in terms of our investment assumptions. Mortality assumptions have gotten more conservative. But the blue line, the assets haven't been able to really keep up with the red line. You see that that gap is actually growing. That shark's mouth is just going to keep widening, actually, in the future. Uh, SAC Metro has been making payments every year to, to, to SCRS, but the payments haven't been able to keep up and catch up with that, with that red line. Um, and what that has an effect of is that your funding ratio, just for the SCRS benefits, which you know had crested around 120 percent right after this agreement happened, right after the, the mergers started happening, but they just started trending down and down, and so it's about 50 percent of the assets are available to pay for benefits now. So there's about 90 million dollars in liabilities, and only about 45 million dollars in assets that we attribute to um, to Sacramento Metro at this point. And what the real risk is in the future is about the projected benefit payments. And currently, we're paying out of the trust fund about $5 million a year in benefits to floor and fire retirees. And because of the, the baby, boomer dem, dem, uh, baby boomer demographic sort of phenomenon, um, we're, and we're expecting all the floor and firefighters to be retired within a, another few years. You're cresting at about $7 million a year in payments. So let's say that $45 million is depleted and it's, and it's gone. We will come and collect the money still from SAC Metro to make sure that these firefighters have, the retired firefighters and their families have the retirement benefits paid for that they've earned for their career and service. So it's about $7 million a year um, in about you know, 20, 30 years from now. And as the man is going to talk about in a second, the funding plan basically levels out at about four and a half million dollars, and that's a lot cheaper to pay a little bit more now than you're paying today, and have it sort of flat and even, and be able to have enough money set aside for benefits for the long term. And I'll turn it back over to. So the recommended payment plan, as, as Eric alluded to, um, really has us paying off the current 
unfunded liability by 2036, 37. So instead of paying it off between now and 2022, we're paying it off between now and 2036, 37. And in the, the early years of that agreement, so essentially the, the first um, seven years, 18, 19 through 2024, 20, 25, the annual payments would ramp up. So starting at about 3.1 million in 2018, 19, um, going up to 4.3 million by 2024, 25. And then for the remaining 12 years of the agreement, 25, 26 through 36, 37, we would have level annual payments of approximately four and a half million dollars. And the, the reason um, for us to, to sort of have that ramp up and then the leveling off in 2025, 26 is that the district will have paid off its pension obligation bonds in 2025. Um, so that creates some additional room in the budget in those years um, to accommodate larger payments. So that was kind of the thinking behind behind the timing there for us. Um, I do want to point out that, um, that these numbers that we're talking about relate to the current unfunded liability. Um, so under this agreement, as, as in the existing agreement, there would be an annual evaluation done and any gains or losses in future years would be amortized over a three-year period. So that, that would be an adjustment um, to these payments amounts to account for any future gains or losses. Those adjustments wouldn't start until um, 2019-20, so the 18-19 the um, contribution at this point is set, and then future um, contributions would be adjusted based on future gains and losses. Uh, that concludes our presentation, but I'm happy, happy to take any questions um, you have of me or Eric. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions or comments? I have one question. Dr. Gale. I'm not being morbid, <laughs> and I call you Alexander Hamilton, that as the older personnel go to glory, things start smoothing out a bit, don't they? So because you, we had, they had a different I think you're, you're alluding to this, where we see the, the payments over time drop off, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, expenses go down a bit. At least right. we have one system that we can control easier than having the formal systems and they are come on a different kind right, of right in terms of in terms of scurs versus yes. versus calpers this is, this is a fixed number of people that is not going to grow anymore right. so um, and unfortunately you know just <laughs> life, life happens and the the payments will will go down uh, over time mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the uh, presentation. Uh, when, when you look at this, I'm, I'm glad we're planning. Most importantly that you said tonight is that we are gonna guarantee those retirement payments to the firefighters that deserve them. So yeah. to me, that's most important. I believe to the board as well that we make good on our promises. And thank you for working together and having that foresight. Thank you for working with us and <laughs> not coming and digging deeper, I guess I could say for lack of better terms, but we're coming out to a better agreement that's gonna be best for all of us. I truly appreciate it. Can Director Gould. A quick question. So I'm looking at the slide that you have up there and I'm looking at the footnote. And do you see a, a challenge there? Because that's a long time into the future. Right, so the actuaries, uh, the actuaries model this based on their statistical black, I mean, that's just a box. really long time in right. the future so they, to use. They, they project out, um, you know, that tail continues for literally 100 years. It's kind of hard to imagine that it really happens, but. I just wanted to, I just wasn't. Confident that that was correct, but you're yeah, saying yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> it just keeps going, but that's the drones. That's some pretty working. old people. All right. Well, uh, this is an action item, so Mr. Chair, I make a motion we adopt. Second. I'll second. Okay. Motion and a second, Madam Clerk. Director Gale. Yes. Gould. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Wood. Aye. Clark. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Ann Barnes. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you again for taking the time out of your Thank night you. to explain that to us. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Okay, moving on to reports. President report, I do not have any at this time. We'll move on to the fire chief's report. Chief Holmes. President Barnes and uh, board members, uh, good evening. Uh, just a couple things tonight. We had a new hire as a lateral firefighter, paramedic Al Lopez, started on the 25th. Uh, we have a... Um, Assistant Chief's promotional opportunity. We'll be doing interviews right after the 4th of July for that one. Um, continue with some meetings going on. The county fire chiefs all met last week, uh, discussed a number of items, uh, met with the city, 
uh, as they're going through a number of things and had a labor management uh, meeting this past week. Uh, today we had our annual uh, Sacramento Regional Firework Safety Task Force um, news conference. Uh, it was well attended by all of the uh, fire service uh, in the area at the, the local, state, and at the county, and uh, a huge showing on the uh, law enforcement side there. And I think just about every news station was out there. Uh, Captain Vestal had put that together and did a, a great job of, of setting that up. We'd actually had a fire uh, that was caused by fireworks, and so we moved the location to there and set up at that location. Um, I uh, briefed you, uh, we had a, a break in at Fire Station 51 uh, last week, and I know I briefed all of you, there was a person that was uh, detained uh, from that, um, and they are kind of working that through the system right now. Um, only the last thing is that um, on the 3rd is a memorial service for the Long Beach firefighter that was shot and killed uh, last week. Uh, local 522 along with Trevor is going to take a company down and represent the district uh, on that Tuesday um, in Long Beach. Uh, the only other thing is have a happy 4th of July unless you have any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions or comments for the Chief? All right, moving on to operations report, Deputy Chief Bridge. Good evening, President Barnes. Uh, board members, Chief Harms, I'm Eric Bridge, Deputy Chief Operations. Um, the calls continue to trend. We're approaching that 4,000 calls since the last board meeting with about 3,000 of those being EMS and our transporting consisting at the 74% mark. So that's uh, good news. Um, some other things I wanted to report about though, fire activity is obviously increasing, most of you are aware of uh, with the hot weather and now that the uh, safe and sane are out there, uh, fireworks, we're uh, starting to see some additional um, starts from those, even whether they're inadvertent or not. Um, one of our most recent ones that I just was noted yesterday that uh, broke out in the south area and broke into some, uh, the fire broke out into some uh, old beat up vehicles at one of the junkyards down there and that burned up about 30 or 40 vehicles. So um, that was requiring the assistance of uh, Sacramento City along with many of our metro units um, and Kasumnas as well. So our, our folks are um, getting very, very busy out there. Um, they're out, they're returning back from from the the Pawnee incident, uh, actually they're going to be coming. Some of them will be back tomorrow. Some have already been returning today. So we did deploy uh, approximately. It was about twenty. What we have about twenty two of our firefighters that went out, and uh, we had a couple overhead people that went out. Some of them went up to the Redding area, um, and then they've been redeployed over here to Lake County area. So since then, those fires are starting to make their way down. Um, they're getting control and containment on those and we should see most of our resources back in the fire station. Um, most of them are back now, and then we'll see the rest of them back by tomorrow or the next day. Um, with that, uh, we've had a couple of uh, requests for our helicopter, and I'm happy to report that our, our copter has been very valuable in uh, some recent rescues. One of them notable that was last week was in Nevada County up by an area called Beals Falls, where we had a gentleman that was hiking and fell about 100 feet and uh, CalSTAR was requested out there for medical help and uh, to fly the patient out. They, what they realized, though, that they didn't have the capabilities to get them out of the canyon. They were able to make patient contact, so they started and initiated that. We got there within about 15 minutes, excuse me, about 30 minutes. We were able to lower our hoist and our paramedic down to the victim about 120 feet, where they effected the rescue, brought the patient back up to to the CalSTAR folks, so they were able to transport them quickly. Uh, gentleman suffered bilateral femur fractures, but um, fortunately survived. So that was one of the um, recent rescues that we've been requested for. Um, we also were requested last week, there was a 14-year-old, unfortunately had uh, fell into the water in the river, but the good news is there was uh, the prognosis looks good. Uh, quick uh, uh, bystander CPR was initiated, and uh, our helicopter was requested, landed right there next to, close to where they were performing the CPR, was loaded, and it was about a two minute transport time to Mercy San Juan. So upon a uh, CPR was in progress through, but upon their arrival, the patient had pulses and a blood pressure. So, and uh, from what we're hearing now, the prognosis looks promising. I haven't had any further details, but 
Um, we're happy to at least report that. So special uh, kudos also out to the crews of Engine 61 and the AMR crews that were on scene. Um, some of the bystander CPRs, we're still doing some research on that to find out. And we understand there could have been some law enforcement or park rangers, uh, but we are going to, um, we want to recognize those, um, those citizens for doing that bystander CPR. Um, that was probably the, the gist of it. We're also getting lots of requests for a helicopter um, through these incidents as well. So everyone wants to share in our helicopter. Well, this is good news though. They're getting lots of use and they have a tremendous amount of expertise and a tremendous amount of training level um, that, and then this is, these are the reasons why we're getting called. So we're excited to help out and uh, that's all I have for tonight's report unless you have any questions. Thank you very much for that report. Any questions or comments? Okay. Thank you for the okay. report out on that. <clears throat> Moving on to Firefighter Local 522, Vice President Jameson. Good evening, directors, President Barnes, Chief Harms, Trevor James, and Local 522. Uh, just also before, one of your consent items tonight was uh, voting on a, um, a change to deferred comp, our uh, advisor. I just wanted, as a proud member of that committee, uh, we, I wanted to speak for a minute and say that uh, we appreciate the trust that the board has always placed that committee. Um, it's nine individuals, some active, some retired, and they take their role very seriously of delivering a deferred compensation plan to the members and the retirees that is second to none. So I appreciate the support and I appreciate the trust that you as a board has placed in that committee. Thank you very much. Um, 522, it's always good to be here. It's good to see you. I saw a lot of you at the Tropical Affair. It was fun to hang out and chat. Um, I think one thing, I, I don't have a lot to say tonight other than just sitting here with you and looking at what's going on in this department. Very progressive, um, a lot of thought to the future, some really great people. I, listening to Captain Gifford, who was a classmate of mine as a paramedic intern, give that presentation. I, I'm pretty proud to have him stand up here and make that presentation about something. So I think uh, just going forward, we're in good hands. Uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to sit down with the chief and Amanda and work through the, the scourge situation. We had members thinking we were somehow going to just let that thing go and they're not going to get their retirement. But I can tell you, and I will stay here in public record, that we will protect our members' retirements. And I, it's, I think we made a good decision. We worked together on it. And I appreciate the seat at the table for that. So again, it's always good to be here. It's good to hang out and, and chat. And I appreciate what you guys do for the membership as well. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I just want to thank you for being here again tonight, but also uh, taking a leadership role and taking a company down to represent Metro Fire at such a tragic event. So again, thank you for being here tonight. And I, I appreciate the chiefs and see you guys supporting that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that is very important for someone in our uh, roles to do. So appreciate that. Well done. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the committee and delegate reports. Executive committee, we do not have any report out. And the next meeting is to be determined. After I just skipped somebody, did I? You're good. Oh, no, you're getting ready. Came up. Curtain call. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> moving on to the Communications Center, JPA. Uh, who's I'll, Chief, I'll speak for Chief, uh, Chief Johnson. Okay. Uh, Chief Johnson is out of town tonight. Uh, they had a special and a regular meeting and a special meeting on Tuesday, June 26th. I cannot report on that one. Uh, you'll have to hear from him that when he gets back. Uh, next meeting is July 24th at 9 a.m. Tuesday. Right. Thank you very much. And then now moving on to the California Fire Rescue and JP, Chief Shannon. Great. Thank you. Uh, we had a board meeting last Thursday, June 21st, uh, across the hall in the SESC. And I was just going to, um, Christy Haverty and Landa Nielsen over there, the staff over there, really put together a good comprehensive uh, report for us at our board meeting. So I want to share a couple stats with you uh, moving forward with the JPA. We had met for some time, so um, it was good to uh, meet as a group. Um, what you see in front of you is, is basically a three-year snapshot. Obviously, 18 and 19 is going to be a, a projection. Um, and it goes from 19 classes uh, back in 16, 17 up to 84 classes that are projected. Most of those are already scheduled. Um, and we're, we're moving on from hundreds to you know, getting into the 1,300, 1,400 students that are be trained. Um, with that, you know, I'll, I'll throw this uh, next slide out, hopefully. And there's just a list. And, and those are some of the classes that you're, you're going to see that the JPA, the training JPA, is, is coming through and, and uh, uh, training our, our members, uh, the members of the JPA, and actually members of the region that, that come here to uh, Metro Fire and, and get that training. Um, you know, we, we, there were some 
uh, financial difficulties in the past. Uh, we, I think we have overcome that. We, have, uh, we are in the positive now, um, not by a whole lot, but we are making strides. And I believe just showing that how many classes are coming up next year and projected, uh, we are moving in the right direction. Uh, we've had numerous conversations with Chief Harms and uh, the other agencies that are involved in the JPA, and, and we're kind of getting back to basics. We're getting back to the training, and we're really going to have the training chiefs get down and, and look at what are our needs. And that goes down to, like you said, all those classes up there, and there's uh, many, many classes up there that, that will be uh, represented by the JPA this uh, next year. So with that, um, that was uh, last Thursday, and our next meeting is scheduled for September 20th, Thursday, uh, 2018, across the hall in the SESC at 4 o'clock. Do you guys have any? Thank you for that report. Any questions or comments? Thank you very much. Moving on to the Finance and Audit Committee, Director Kelly. Yes, the Finance and Audit Committee met this evening. We received a financial report through April 30th, 2018. Everything looks the way it's going to be. Very good. Thank you. Moving on to the Policy Committee, Director Gould. No report. No report. TBD on the next meeting. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on to the board members' questions and comments. I will start over to my far right, Director Gale. Well, five season really put a stress on, on an organization, and uh, you've done an exemplary job in spite of the stressfulness on positions. Um, good luck and be smart. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Director Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to reiterate what's been said already. Really impressed with uh, the presentations tonight. Uh, the quality of our negotiations with our unfunded liability is, I think, really telling of uh, how well we work with our partners and protect the promises that have been made decades ago. That's really a powerful message to the community. And really, I, I just enjoy the fact that we've got men and women that are looking for opportunities to continue to improve the service delivery, that w which is what we're all about. And so what we saw tonight, I think, is a really great example of how the men and women at, at the you know, boots on the ground level are, are taking some ownership and saying, what can we do as an organization to keep us at the cutting edge? And, and it's just, it's incredible. You know, it's going to keep me up tonight thinking that there's a drone over my house. <laughs> thanks. There's two. Great. Gr thanks. There's two. <laughs> Great job. Really proud of all of you. Please be safe at this time of year uh, with all of the crazies we've got living in this community and, and inappropriate fireworks. So uh, good job. It, it's, I'm proud to be a director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, Director Rosali. Uh, just a moment. I wanted to take um, this opportunity to thank uh, Matt Roseberry and uh, and Chief Shannon for allowing me to annoy them during the week with a, a uh, meeting about two initiatives, one, the leadership legacy um, a recognition and uh, the key indicators of success that will be uh, posted on the new uh, upcoming website. I really appreciated your time and your support in those initiatives. And of course, I also had the opportunity, as I do nearly every week, to uh, annoy the board clerk, and I appreciate her time as well. Thank you. Copy. Thank you. All right, moving over to the left, Director Kelly. Uh, a lot of fires going on out there, and uh, I just hope everybody stays safe and, uh, you know, people and uh, property is protected. Thank you very much. Director Clark. I echo the uh, sentiments of my uh, fellow uh, board members. Um, I don't know if this is the time to talk about fire camp um, since Brenda Briggs is not here and uh, Captain Jim, uh, what's, I forgot his last name, Fredericks, Fredericks? Richard. Richards, yeah, yes. I, I um, spent a little time at fire camp. Uh, <laughs> Director Wood was there also. And uh, it was just remarkable. It, it, it just never, never fails to amaze me. Uh, what a great program that is. Um, I had a little boy that um, a sponsor, and he didn't want anything to do with it at first. You know, as told his mom he didn't want to be there. Uh, at the beginning of uh, the day, the beginning of the, the, the camp, and then at the end of the day, he didn't want to go home. And uh, so 
he made uh, he made a lot of friends. Uh, um, in fact, when they were doing the uh, presentations and everything, he didn't want to sit with his mother and his sister because he made all these little friends. I think it's a wonderful program, and I I am wholly behind it. Uh, I think it's 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 just great, and and I really appreciate the uh, our volunteers taking the time to uh, to uh, help these kids out. It's just, a, it's just a wonderful program. It's a great intro for the um, kids in a community that never have a chance to be around firefighters. I mean, they're just so impressed and they, the the parents were just uh, um, very appreciative. I had one mother that she was just so, she, she was just so happy and wanted to know how we can, can you know, how she could help and, you know, and, and keep her kid uh, uh, being engaged in, in uh, in our organization. So I think that's just one of the greatest programs that uh, Metro Fire uh, has during the year. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Director Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll echo what uh, Director Clark said. Fire Camp is an absolutely incredible play, um, incredible opportunity for kids in our community, and we wouldn't have it without the support of 522 and the other organizations that support it. Uh, but we also wouldn't have it without the uh, volunteers. Every single person that's out there is a volunteer. None of them are on the payroll when they're at fire camp. Um, and this year we had a significant amount of probationary firefighters that are out there uh, trying to get out and help the kids and help the community. So it was, it's a wonderful thing and we appreciate all the support that we get from our members for fire camp. Um, we, I want to say we had a great time at Tropical Affair. got to see... Uh, Trevor Jamison, a few of the other directors up there. We were still short our nine. Uh, there were five of us there. I'd like to see all nine next year. So Grant, plan your trip differently next year. Um, you talk to the wife. <laughs> this, is on, this is public record, so she can watch it. And, and uh, this is my request to you, Mrs. Gold. Um, so I'd like to see all the directors out there next year. It's an absolutely wonderful event. It gets better each year. It gets more crowded each year. And uh, we raise more and more money for the Burn Institute each year. So uh, I'd like to see more out there. Um, on a final note, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, in recognition of the loss of uh, Long Beach Fire Captain Dave Rosa, I think we should end with a moment of silence for him. Agreed. Agreed. We will do that. Thank you very much for your comments. Director Sheets. Good evening. Uh, I wanted to recognize all the members and acknowledge uh, all the hard work that they do daily, especially as uh, wildfires are increasing, we're sending out strike teams, um, and then the increase in the mandatories to backfill those, um, and just acknowledge um, you know, them. I also wanna recognize the Air Operations Division and all the hard work and all the training that they have done over the last uh, few years, and it's paying off um, with that uh, hoist rescue and field save, and it's uh, great to hear that we're you know, doing well with that division. Um, Thank you so much for the UAV presentation and the SCURS presentation. It was very informative. And um, also, I'd like to send uh, Long Beach Fire Captain Rosa and um, uh, his family uh, condolences and send prayers. And I hope everybody has a safe uh, 4th of July. Thank you for your comments. Director Jones. Thank you. I'd like to reiterate uh, all the points that my fellow directors have made. I appreciate all the uh, the comments, both the uh, the fun part, the fundraising part, as well as all the sad aspects of the, the things that happen and occur in this line of work. I would like to add two particular thank yous. One is to uh, Chief Greg Cassatini, as well as Fire Marshal Lisa Barsdale, for uh, helping to work through and continuing work with the Firework Safety Task Force. It continues to be successful. It continues to educate all of our uh, community about the proper use of safe and sane fireworks, as well as helping to deal with the illegal ones and the use of said illegals to try and make our community safer and safer. So I appreciate your efforts uh, for continuing that and continuing success for the Fireworks Safety Task Force. Thank you very much. Also, I'd like to say thank you to CFO Thomas, who helped me out with some of my uh, basic questions on our uh, discussion item, our presentation item today, or the action item for the SCURS retirement. Thank you for going in depth with me on a couple of the numbers. I appreciate that very much. All right. 
<clears throat> Thank you for the comments. Going last is never fun, especially when everything's uh, already been said and talked about. But I think if we really reflect back on tonight's meeting, it encapsulates everything that we do as a fire district. We talked about the history of it. We talked about the present and we talked about the future, even on the Scourge presentation of a 100 year outlook on the financial report. Um, but the reality is it goes to show what a major organization, first class organization that we are from the, not only the leadership, the membership and the representatives from the unions, um, but to see where we're going in the future, being that leader, adding the classes where everybody's gonna wanna come here to train and be part of this, again, that puts us out in the front. So I appreciate everything. Captain Vessel and partnering with the Sacramento Kings, you can't get with a bigger organization. And to have our brand and logo attached with that as a community outreach program, huge. CFO Thomas, I'll never question your numbers, but I truly appreciate your forethought. Sitting down at the table in the SCURS committee to sit down and actually talk about how do we resolve this and take care of our members long after they're gone and they've uh, earned their retirement. So again, thank you for everything uh, that everybody does. First class organization from frontline people to the professional staff that really do all the heavy lifting and make everybody look good, especially the leadership of the organization and us. Hope everybody has a safe uh, 4th of July. Again, I always talk about these moments. We have the men and women and many members working on that day when most are home uh, celebrating with their families. So for them, I, I hope they get to have a great day and spend some time with their families as well because they will be busy. It is a very busy time of year. Um, truck 50 coming out again, thank you very much. It's great to see those, uh, I call them toys because it looks like a brand new truck and has all the toys. But to spend that kind of money to have a truck like that and know that it's in this region and can provide safety quickly uh, is again, it's a great thing for our fire district. Um, as recommended, we will have a moment of silence for everybody, uh, for Fire Captain Dave Rosa, who was fatally shot on Monday in a senseless act. You think you're, fire, you're responding to provide emergency service to save lives, and someone takes actions in their own hands to take another's. Abs absolutely unexplainable and unacceptable. But also recognize uh, Firefighter Ernesto Torres, who was also uh, wounded during that, and wish him a speedy recovery. So. Uh, Trevor, as you take the company down, please pass on our condolences to uh, Long Beach down there and people in the fire industry that this is a family, all right, and, and when one goes down, everybody cares. I, I really don't like seeing the black bands over the uh, badges because that's usually never, I can't say usually, it is never a good sign, but thank you for uh, recognizing him and uh, paying tribute. So again, we'll end in a moment of silence. You can all stand. Thank you very much. I'll adjourn the meeting. Next meeting will be July 12, 2018 at 6 p.m.